Friends, the stories that we tell one another are very, very significant because they shape our opinions, they influence our perspectives, they guide our morality. And this morning I wish to tell you a story from the Jewish tradition. There was a man who was a very successful farmer. And he was so successful that he always assumed that he was on God's side. And one day, God appeared to him. And God decided to grant this individual three wishes. The farmer could not imagine his good fortune. He was overjoyed. And so for his very first wish, he asked for 100 head of cattle. And yet, there was a catch. You see, when God said that God would grant three wishes to this very fortunate farmer, he indicated that his neighbor would receive twice whatever he received. And so this man was completely overjoyed when he received these 100 head of cattle. And then, well, he was a little forlorn when his neighbor ended up with 200. And then he got to his second wish. He said, Lord, I wish for 100 acres of land. And you know where this is going. He received that hundred acres of land. He was totally overjoyed with what he had. And then in an instant, his joy was gone on account of his jealousy. When he looked over at his neighbor's land where it had now been expanded by 200 acres and he was just consumed and racked by this feeling of envy. And so for his third wish, what did he do? Well, he leaned very, very hard into the unfortunate measures of human nature. And he asked God that he might be struck blind in one eye. Knowing, of course, that his neighbor would be completely blinded as a result, and God wept. My fellow disciples in Jesus Christ, how easy it is for us to wag our fingers at the Pharisees and the scribes for their lack of compassion, for their hard-heartedness in the face of very apparent human need, and how right we are to shudder and to recoil at that ancient Jewish story that I just relayed where jealousy got the best of that farmer's intentions, it is a tragedy, is it not, that this man's joy was squandered by the presence of resentment and envy. And yet these stories speak to us. Not necessarily the way that we would expect, We oftentimes, as individuals who have been in the church perhaps for decades, we see ourselves right there alongside Jesus. We are the ones saying, yeah, you tell them, that's right. But what if the story is really speaking to us? What if we are really the ones who are lost? What if we are the ones who are being called out. Because, you know, Scripture has a very peculiar way of speaking directly to us. And here we are reminded of our tendency to grumble at the good things that happen in the lives of others. Theologically, this begs a very important question. We claim, of course, as Protestant Christians, as as we have for centuries, that we are saved by grace through faith. We are suspicious of all of those claims that say that we can somehow attain God's mercy, that we can somehow be forgiven, that we can somehow get all the way to the mountaintop on account of our good works. We are suspicious of that, and rightly so. 
Instead, we, we say that we are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift, an absolute, unmerited gift. And yet, when we grumble at the sight of our neighbor's good fortune, well, we turn all of that on its head. We pretend to live as those who believe in merit instead of mercy. And so we are wise to ask ourselves, do we believe that we have to earn God's grace and begrudge others who seem to receive grace as a gift? And if we do, then we will surely scorn God's goodness to others. And we will resent to the last God's energetic seeking of those whom we prefer to avoid. Our gospel lesson this morning is a very interesting series of parables. We hear only two of three, only two of this three-part trilogy. Jesus has a very specific message for the sinners and the tax collectors and also for these Pharisees and these scribes, does he not? The text tells us that the sinners and the tax collectors were coming near to hear Jesus, to glean his wisdom, perhaps to be his disciples. Their hearts seemed to be in the right place. They were sincere. They were seeking. They were searching. And as is often the case in Scripture, Well, the people like me, the religious leaders, well, they were a little bit off track. The text says that the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling. And they were saying, oh, this fellow Jesus, he welcomes sinners and he eats with them. And it is this mindset which prompts these two parables that we hear this day. Two parables about that which is lost. First, we hear about a shepherd. He had 100 sheep, which is, of course, a nice round number until one of those goes missing. He he doesn't notice at first. We can only imagine why this sheep chooses to wander away from the fold. Perhaps it has spotted some grass that looks just a little bit greener on the other side. And so he wanders just a little bit closer to that other side and seeing that that grass looks ever so pleasing, wanders just a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. Have you ever been there? Before you know it, The sheep is lost, alone, vulnerable. Because while the grass may seem greener on the other side, it is often better to be content with what one has than searching for the next best thing. The shepherd performs a routine with which many of us are familiar. He goes about the business of counting all of the sheep in his flock. And time and time again, he gets to the wrong number, 99. He is missing one. No matter how many times he counts them, one is not there. And he begins to grow anxious. He has someone to answer to, this shepherd. He has a boss, the one who owns this flock, and he wouldn't dare return to the owner of these fields without the full complement of sheep. But he does something very curious, something reckless even. He leaves these 99 sheep behind in search of the one that is lost. Friends, would we do the same? Would we choose to leave the 99 sheep behind 
knowing full well that a wolf might come into the midst of that flock and snatch them up, would we choose to leave the 99 behind knowing that the same thing could happen to any of those that happened to the one that was lost, that he might just keep wandering and, and searching for greener pastures somewhere else? Would we have the conviction and the mindset of doing that or would we try to find some help and find a more efficient way of solving this problem. You know, this parable reminds me a lot of when Jesus told the parable of the sower. Perhaps you remember that one. God is imagined as one who has all of these seeds. And the sower, God, goes out into all kinds of different soil, rocky soil, thorny soil, and good soil, and those seeds are scattered all about, no matter what the soil quality, whatever the occasion. A God like that doesn't make very much sense because it's not efficient. We know that God would have been better off, would perhaps get a better yield, right? If God focused attention only on the good soil and cultivating that, but we seem to believe in a God who's interested in everybody. Not just the lowest hanging fruit, not just the one who is eager to do everything that God says. God even draws alongside those who are lost, who go wandering off on their own accord. People who don't even seem to have a clue that they are lost. God seeks them diligently, patiently, persistently until they are found. And according to this parable, it doesn't end there, but once the sheep is found as it is, the, the shepherd picks the sheep up, puts it on his shoulders, returns not only back to the flock, but to his friends and to his neighbors and says, celebrate with me. Rejoice in what I have found. Thanks be to God for this good news, for the one that is lost is now back in my fold once again. Jesus then tells a similar story. It is a second parable in this trilogy. It's about a woman who has ten coins. They're called drachmas. We're talking about 10 days wages. Or what would have been a very significant uh, amount of saving. Months and months of saving. There's no mention here of a husband. Perhaps this woman is a widow and was quite poor. Regardless, it's kind of exceptional and, and very interesting that Jesus equates God with a woman that wasn't typically done in that day and age. But Jesus did it. And he says that God is like this woman who has lost one of these ten drachma. And she's searching diligently for it all throughout the house. She's looking high. She's looking low. She's sweeping under the lamp stands. And when she finds it, she rejoices. Look at what I have found. What is lost is now mine once again. And just like in that parable with the lost sheep, she invites those nearby, her friends, her relatives, her loved ones, the community, rejoice with me. Scripture tells us that God is able to make our joy complete. So I find it incredibly curious when folks who are not a part of the church perhaps have had bad experiences in the church which 
makes me mourn deeply, where they tend to view folks like us as those who come with a list of thou shalt not. Of people who wish to guilt them and shame them and tell them how they're not living up to God's standards. And I wonder, have any of these other Christians ever read Luke? Do they not know that our God is the one in Jesus Christ who's constantly searching for the sheep? Not to guilt them, there's no guilt trip here. But merely to rejoice. This is not about guilt, it's not about shame, it's about joy, it's about making our joy complete, it's about providing more joy in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our world. Do you hear the vision? Can you see it? Can you feel it? Do you wish to be a part of it? Because that is the way that God is calling to us this day. There was a shepherd in the fields. There was a woman diligently sweeping her house. When they found what was lost, they rejoiced. Friends, let us rejoice as well in this good news. May all thanks be to the God of love both now and forever. Amen.